Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. This is Colin and today we are going to do a playthrough of Vagrant Song. This is a one to four player game, but when you do play with one player, you need to control at least two characters, which is what we will do in this playthrough. This is a campaign style game. You are going against different bosses. You're on a train. You don't really know why you're on the train. There's these haints, which are the bosses. You are trying to save them and have them gain humanity while you're trying to keep your own humanity. It's very interesting. I like it. It's a unique theme and setting, which is pretty cool. Without further ado, let's go ahead and set up and we'll do our playthrough of chapter one. Before I go any farther, don't forget to turn on those Klingon subtitles. They should be popping up right here if you have them on. In case I miss anything in editing and someone tells me, I will put the corrections there. So make sure to have those on, especially because there are a few things in this game that I'm not 100% sure I'm doing right. <laughs> so that way you can get the most correct answers. All right, so we are going to play with two of Vagrants. Our first one is going to be the Songsmith, because who doesn't want to play a banjo to save the humanity of these hands? I do. <laughs> uh, so up top here, this is your humanity track. He starts at 10. He does have a specific ability called Upbeat Tempo. This states if you only have one coin on a skill, reduce the success value of that skill by one. You'll see how that works as we play. He has the general five actions here, moving, rummaging. You can hit them and increase their humanity. Don't ask how that works. <laughs> Investigating and healing. He has two skills he starts off with, a little rhythm and an old medley. And then when you are playing, you will want to grab the three coins that have the same symbol as your vagrant. So you can see I have the three music notes. They will be A, Bs, and Cs. And you're going to use these, first of all, when it's your turn to activate the different abilities on your board. But then during the camp phase, you'll use those to buy sp specific uh, skill cards or junk cards. Because you can see right now I have no junk, but we can find some junk. And and uh, we, we can slot it there if we use our coins for it. Also, if ever you are defeated, so both of your skills become wounded, which happens when you go down to zero humanity twice, since I have two skills, you become westbound. You'd flip this card over, and then you will actually place out your westbound skill. So just have that handy. Hopefully we won't need this for the first scenario. Our second Vagrant will be our Curse Bear. She has nine total humanity. You always start with two skills, and you're going to see these skills have a little arrow, and that tells you which side you will place that on your character. So you can see our Curse Bear, just like our Songsmith, can only have two skills on this side and two skills on this side and one junk. You're going to see that the numbers over here are slightly different than they are for our Songsmith. Uh, we'll talk about all of those as we play. We have our three coins, and let's talk about her innate ability. Once per turn, when you are haunted, the haunt gains one humanity. So opposite to us, where we are losing humanity when we take damage, if we damage the haint, they're actually gaining humanity. So if ever we get haunted, which simply means the haunt either moves into our same space or moves through our space, we actually cause them to take a damage or increase their humanity. Next, what you'll want to do is set up the bindle bag. However, for this playthrough, I'm going to have it be the bindle cup. It's a lot easier for my hand to, to fit in there. This is a tight... <laughs> it's hard to pull the tokens out of here even uh, when you're not recording. So I just decided we'll use the one-stop co-op shop mug to pull for our tokens. The first scenario of the game is called Shelter from the Storm. This is how we're going to set up the board. So you want to think of the board as being a train. These are three train cars. You can see the Vs. That's where we can start with our two vagrants. This is where the haunt will start. The haunted's name is Turned Faces for this scenario. And each scenario, I believe, will have a different haunt. I haven't played all of these, obviously. Uh, so I don't know if they're always different. But from what I understand, and looking at the box, there's tons of haints. And each one generally just has one because it's a boss battler. Up at the top of the page, you're going to see for two players, the humanity threshold for the haint is eight, since we're playing with two. If we were playing with four, it would be at 12. So we'll set ours to eight. You can also see there's some terrain on the board. There's actually event tokens that are on the board that we can investigate. There's an event token on round three, and then there are two over here on the break side. How this game works, you are trying to get the haint to up to that humanity threshold, which is eight. Every time you do that, you essentially break the haint. You're going to move that uh, B marker up one. After you've done that three times for this scenario, you win the game. 
each time that happens though, you're going to see this seven and zero. Those events are gonna go off whenever we break the hate and then they go back to zero and you try and get them back up to that eight humanity. Now let's go ahead and read about our story. You're just one from a handful of train hoppers trying to find shelter from the storm. You don't recognize any familiar faces and come to think of it, you don't even remember seeing them hop on the train with you. But every one of them swears up and down that they just got here. And based on your own experience, you can't help but believe them. The strange thing is that everyone seems to be from a different part of town, or towns, places you've never even heard of. After a few handshakes and how do you do's, you all try to settle in as best you can. But without a hay bale or old cushion calling your name, neither the train nor the situation brings you much comfort. The only thing you all have in common, it seems, is the welcoming hand that helped each of you aboard. White glove, loose skin. Couldn't forget it if you tried. You can't tell if it's a good or bad thing that Mr. Welcoming Hand appears to be missing. Either way, hopefully things stay nice and peaceful on this leg of the journey. That sinking feeling in your gut is telling you otherwise. For our setup, we have to place our tokens, trains, and markers all shown above. We'll place our vagrants on the V spaces. Place the threshold token on the appropriate space, that's eight for us. Place the turned faces on the designated space. And then the three shelter from the storm ritual cards in their designated space. I'll show you that in a second. Once players are ready to begin, read event one. You can see here there are no special rules for this scenario. We also don't have any special terrain effects for this scenario. Just remember that haints can actually move onto and through terrain, but we cannot. We have to move around them. And then there are haint effects. There's generally two of them. Uh, we have the shakes and spooked. The shakes say lower your move value by one. And then to remove it, uh, to remove the shakes, you have to discard an iron nail. And just so you know, you can't have multiples of the shakes. So if I have the shakes and I would gain the shakes, nothing happens. I already have it. Same thing with Spooked. If you end your turn in range two of the turn faces, lose two humanity. To remove Spook, you have to discard Salt. And all of those things are the different types of tokens that we have in the bindle bag. Uh, so these types. So here's a Salt and here's a Nail, actually, that I just pulled out. I would have to have gained these and then I would discard them to be able to discard these Haint effects. As I was mentioning before, every time the Haint hits their humanity value, which for us is eight, that threshold, then we break the hate. So when the turn faces break, each vagrant may rummage one. Normally you can't do that. Uh, you always will have this. Whenever a hate breaks, the next turn the hate would have is skipped and all vagrants will gain one humanity. The effect above is unique to the turn faces. So normally we won't be able to rummage one. We just get to do that in this scenario. And then our victory condition here, we want to save the turn faces. So that's what you're doing. You're saving these ghosts, which is cool. I like that unique twist to the game. Uh, to save the turn faces, give them back all their lost humanity until they have no more breaks. We've set up our two vagrants over here. Remember, I could have chosen any of these four spots, but I chose these two. Here we have the turned faces uh, haint. We have a cycle track down here, which we will see how that works during the playthrough. On the top of the board, this is where we track the humanity of the haint. Every damage that we do will increase the humanity. And when we hit that threshold, we've broken the haint one time. Here is our round marker. After each round, we'll move this up one. When we get to the third round, we'll read event three. The track over here called breaks tracks how many breaks we need to do on the haint in order to win the game, or I should say complete breaking the ghost. Some scenarios, I don't think that's always the goal, but for this one it is. So each time we break them, we'll move this down. And then when we hit this one, we'll read event seven. And this one will read event zero. Each scenario will have three rituals that we can complete, which will help us either in camp or during the scenario or sometimes both. So these are things we can try to do. We don't have to do, but if we do them, we generally get a positive effect. On the backside, there are rewards. We don't get to see what they are, but I do know what they are since I did a practice play. So it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> we have here, this ritual is strangers on a train. As a team, remove two haint effects to complete this ritual. So we have to have people gain haint effects and then discard that salt or the nails to get rid of them. Once we do two of those, we gain this one. Uh, this ritual number two here, long stretch on a lonely road. 
if the turn face is moved from train card A to train card C or vice versa in a single turn, complete this ritual. That's going to be kind of fun. And then our third one, first blood. After a vagrant suffers a wound, remember that's by flipping over one of your skills after losing enough humanity, complete this ritual. So we need to have somebody take enough humanity loss to cause a wound and then we can claim this ritual. We should all be set up and ready to go for our first scenario. I do want to mention there are going to be spoilers in this playthrough, but it's only for scenario one. If that matters to you, I would recommend stopping here. But if you want to see if this game is uh, something that you're interested in, I do recommend watching this scenario because there are 20 some scenarios in the game. And so understanding how the game works and seeing if it's something that you're interested in might help. Let's go ahead and read event one. It's awfully dark in here, but at least it's quiet. Huh. Doesn't look like you were the only group to hop on after all. Maybe it's time to introduce yourselves. Move the turn faces two spaces towards the break side. And don't forget that Haints can move over and even land on top of terrain and we can't do that. Whenever it says the break side, that is to the right because that's where the break side tracker is. Whenever it says the round sides, that's to the left. If it talks about the humanity track, that's up north. And then the cycle track is down south. So the turned faces is going to move two spaces this way. Most haints in the game have two different moods. They're generally going to start on their good mood and then flip over to their not so good mood. But I think with different scenarios, they might flip back and forth. It's important to understand the turned faces special abilities. So let's look at those for the um, happy face because <laughs> that's what we're going, we're going to be going against at least initially. If the haint is adjacent to the break side edge at the end of its turn, read event five. And you can assume that's not going to be a good thing. So it's going to be running to the right. We're going to try and have to catch it. Also, there's this cycle effect. I haven't talked about cycling. We'll talk about that later. Just know that right now there's no cycle effect. So we don't have to worry about that. The haunted effect, that's if ever the turn faces walks into your space or through you, then you simply lose one humanity. And there's a reminder here that says edges are the outer borders of a train car. So once he gets all the way to that far right side where the brake uh, tracker is, that's when we're going to read event five. Something that I really like about this game is how you activate the haints. So when it's the haints turn, we're just going to draw one of the tokens out of the bindle bag or my bindle cup. And depending upon which one it is, we're going to activate the ability there. And since we're on this side, this is the part of the, bo uh, the book that we're going to look at. But once he gets to the unhappy mood, then we're going to use these abilities. So it can change during the game, which I like. For one round in the game, each of the vagrants are going to activate, and then after each vagrant activates, the haint will activate. So we get to choose the order of our vagrants, but let's say I want to do the songsmith first. It'll be songsmith, then haint, then curse bear, then haint, and then that'll be the end of the first round. So I do think I'm going to start with my songsmith. What we get to do, we have to place all three of our coins out on different actions. Now we could place them onto our skills. The only thing is, if you place one on a skill, the next turn you cannot place one of your uh, coins on that skill. And I should mention, you could place all three coins on that skill. Generally, every skill will have a benefit for having more coins on them. However, I have my upbeat tempo where actually my coins, if I only put one on those specific uh, skills, the success that I need to roll for dice is actually reduced by one, which is nice. Each of the standard actions here, though, you can use every turn. So my movement action, if I put a coin there, I can move two spaces. If I put a coin here in the rummage, I can draw one of those tokens from the rummage cup and keep it. And those all give different abilities, which I'll talk about in a second. If I decide to put a token here or a coin there, that allows me to bust and essentially attack a haint that's adjacent to me. That's within range one. If I'm on a space that has an event marker, I can use the investigate action and then we read whatever that event is. Some of them are auto successes, but some of them you need successes. So if I need successes, depending upon the amount of coins I put there, I roll that many dice trying to hit my two hit value of four and then healing the same thing. If I put two of my coins here, I would roll two dice looking for four pluses and I would heal one humanity per uh, success that I roll. What I think I'm going to do with my Songsmith for this turn is I'm going to do one movement of two and then I'm going to rummage two tokens, but I only get to ever keep one anytime I do that rummage. I can't do rummaging twice a turn then, but the more coins I put there, the more I get to draw and then choose which ones I want to keep. So let's start with our movement. So we'll do a movement of two. 
Movement in the game is orthogonal only for both the Haints and for us, so I cannot move diagonal. I have to move around the terrain the Haints don't. Uh, that's also for range. So the game, you don't have to worry about line of sight. You're just going to count range orthogonally from where you are. So let's say I was trying to do something to that Haint. I would need to have a range of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But that Haint can count through this terrain, 1, 2, 3, 4. So they're only 4 spaces away from me. I'm six spaces away from them to being able to do anything. I've done my movement action. Let's go ahead and look at the different tokens that we can grab from rummaging, and then we'll rummage two tokens, keeping one. There are five different types of tokens. We have our iron nails. A hate within range two gains to humanity. Basically, that's two damage. <laughs> Don't forget that. Candles are interesting. Place in an adjacent open space. Haunts are drawn to the candle for target priority. When a haint moves onto a candle, its movement ends and the candle is discarded. Now, it'll only target a candle if it's in the same boxcar. So if it moves to a different boxcar, it's not going to target a candle that's out there. We have salt. When you as a vagrant are targeted by a haint action, use salt to ignore the effects of that action. Now, it will not ignore the effects for anyone else. So if there's something that's doing uh, area of attack and it's hitting everyone, you can have it ignore you, but not your other vagrants. The rabbit's foot, you may use that as an additional coin for a turn. And then finally, an apple, you can use the apple to heal a wounded skill on yourself. So whenever your humanity goes all the way down to zero, you're going to flip one of your uh, skills over to its wounded sign. This is how you can get them back. Now, you can only use one of these rummage tokens around. So if I gain, let's say, three rummage tokens in a turn, and I try and use one at the beginning of a round, I can't use any other ones for the rest of, the, uh, of that round. Each character also has a limit to the amount of rummage tokens that they can keep. So our songsmith can keep a total of three rummage tokens, which is pretty nice. So since we placed two coins on that, I'm going to draw two of these tokens. So I have either a rabbit's foot or a candle. I'm definitely keeping the rabbit's foot. I'll put the candle back into my cup and then I'll keep this on my card. I can use it in a future round and I can hold up to three of them. And that's the end of my turn. So now we're going to do the Haint's turn. To activate the haint, we're going to grab one of the rummage tokens from our cup, and we grabbed the salt. Now you're going to see I'm placing it here on the cycle track. Every time we draw one for the haint or we use one of the rummage tokens that we have earned, we will then place them onto this cycle track. And you see these numbers here? If I have three or more salt here at the end of that character's turn, it could be a haint's turn or it could be our turn, we're going to cycle all of these back into the bag. Now, right now, the turn faces don't have any negative effects for cycling. That won't normally be the case. Usually, they will be bad effects whenever you cycle. So you got to be careful about cycling. But sometimes you just don't have a chance to do anything because the haint is putting tokens there. So now we're going to look at uh, the AI for the turn faces and see what they're going to do with that salt. This one is nice and easy. Keep running. Vagrants in range lose two humanity. For each vagrant that loses humanity this way, move two towards the break side. And it's within range four. Our poor songsmith, one, two, three, four, is exactly within range four. So he's going to lose two humanity. And because one vagrant has lost humanity, we are going to have the turned faces move two spaces towards the break side. This will mean our songsmith will go down to eight total humanity. That's going to end the Haint's turn. Now it's the Curse Bear's turn. All I think the Curse Bear is going to do this time is rummage with all three of her coins. So that means she's going to draw three. One, two, three. Oh, the apple's good. But I think I'm going to keep the nails and put these two back. The max amount that she can hold is two. It's now back to the Haint. We're going to draw a token and we have a nails token. So let's see what the uh, Haint is going to do. It states we're going to find our way back home. Simply move three spaces towards the break side. As you can see, we cannot keep up with him. <laughs> uh, he's only one, two, three, four away from the break side. Yeah, not much we can do about it. This will end round one. We'll slide to round two. And now either one of us can activate. Let's go ahead and start with our songsmith. All I think I'm going to do is one of each of these. So I'm going to move. I'm going to do an investigate and I'm going to do a rummage. Now I have to place all of my coins before I do any activations, but then I can activate them in any order. Also, I will generate the total amount of movement and then I can split that between any of the actions that I'm doing. So if I had placed two coins there and had four movement, I could move once, do my other action, then move three more times. 
With our movement of two, I think I'll do one here, and then I'm gonna stop there and let's do our investigate. Looks like they left something behind. What kind of traveling tramp starts shredding all their things? We have to do an investigate action. If we get zero successes, we would do what's there. If we get one or more, we do what's here. Our investigate is a four plus, so let's see what we get. We get a five, that'll work. And remember, if I would placed two coins there, I would have gotten to roll two dice instead of just one die. We have here for the one plus. Oh well, this sure looks useful. We get to rummage two, only keep one of the tokens rummaged this way, but you may give the other rummage token drawn to any other vagrant. After keeping a rummage token, add events eight and nine to the bindle, then give the bindle a good shake, then remove event two. So let's grab from our cup, we'll have two of these and essentially we get to keep one and we'll give the other one to our curse bear. Oh, we'll keep the apple and we'll give the salt to the curse bear. We'll then remove the two on the board and we'll place this eight and nine into our cup or the bindle bag if you were playing with that. We had one more movement, so let's move here. We've completed our movement. We've done our investigate. What we haven't done is a rummage. We're going to get our third and final token and it's a rabbit's foot. Boy, we... Yeah, we're set. We'll draw from our rummage cup and we get another nails. That's just going to have them move three more spaces towards the break side. This will mean they are one away from the edge. When they get there, they're going to flip to the unhappy mood. And I have a feeling the game's going to change. For our curse bear this turn, I think the only thing we're going to do is throw all three of our coins here on the movement. I like the two rummage tokens I have. I could do more rummaging, but I don't think I'm going to change these. So, yeah, I'm going to leave it as is because we need salt to get rid of one of the haunt effects and nails to get rid of the other. So we could potentially get rid of both of them uh, should we ever get them. And that's one of the things I actually want to get them to be able to complete that ritual and then get rid of them. Now, you might be wondering what I'm doing. I'm going to move one, two, three, uh, four, I think just over here, and I'm just going to stop there. That's going farther away from the haint, <laughs> but I kind of know what's going to happen soon. Uh, so that helps me a little bit in deciding what I'm going to do. Plus, we do know that we want the haint to go from C to A. This is boxcar A. The one all the way over to the right is boxcar C. So hopefully something will pull him across, and that will uh, complete that ritual. We'll draw for the haint, and we have a rabbit's foot. We have pull it together, moves towards the break side. Vagrants in range move two towards break side and loses two humanity. So he's going to move two towards the break side, and then any of the vagrants within range six, no one's going to be within range six, but he is going to get to the edge. We'll have a move here, and then we'll look at range. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are no vagrants in range, so that's going to end his turn. But now, since he's here, we have to read event five. Can't they see there's no door there? Change the turn face's mood to but not alone. Then the turn faces immediately performs its rabbit foot action on the yonder side. After performing the haunts action, vagrants in range two of the turn faces loses to humanity. The special on the but not alone side for the haint is vagrants in range two of the turn faces cannot remove spooked. We now have a cycle effect. So once we have enough tokens on the cycle track that match one of those numbers, we'll take all of them, put them back into the bag, and then this effect will happen. Vagrants in the same train car move one towards the turn faces, then vagrants adjacent to the turn faces gain spooked. Remember the cycle effect occurs at the end of the current character's turn whenever you do that. Finally, the haunted effect is the same as before, lose one humanity. Here we have the on the yonder effect. Target the furthest vagrant, so that's going to be the curse bear. Move to the furthest adjacent space to the target, haunting any vagrants in the most immediate path towards them. We're grabbing a wide angle shot here so we can see the turn faces is going to move all the way here in the most immediate path. So it's not going to go get the uh, song bear or songsmith and it's going to keep going. It'll move to this side of the curse bear because it moved through the curse bear. The curse bear will lose one humanity plus because of the effect of being adjacent to it, it's going to lose two more. So a total of three humanity will be lost. Our curse bear will go from nine, one, two, three, down to six. However, because the curse bear was just haunted, we're going to have the turn faces gain one humanity. We'll move up one on this track. We also just completed the long stretch on a lonely road ritual. If the turn faces moves from train car A to C in a single turn, complete this ritual. 
The reward for this is the turn faces gains 5 humanity and all vagrants gain 2 humanity. Gain 1 coin to use during the camp phase. We'll move this up by 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2 away from hitting the first break. Our curse bearer will go up to 8 humanity and our songsmith will go up to 10 humanity. That was not bad. We've just completed round 2. Let's move to round 3 and read event number 3. You hear something behind you, a heavy thud, and then a slow drag. Things uh, fall from the top of the train cars all the time, right? Place event 4 on any open space adjacent to the round side in train card A, then remove event 3. I've placed the event 4 marker right here. To start round 3, we're going to use our curse breaker. Now I've set up my 3 coins, I'm going to activate one of my skills. I am going to move and I'm going to do an investigate. And she's a little bit better at investigating. She only needs a 3 plus, unlike our songsmith that needs a 4 plus. And her movement is 3 instead of 2 like the songsmith. So now I've placed those out. I am going to put this onto the cycle track and discard it to essentially deal 2 humanity damage to our hate. This will be our third nails that's here. Remember, the moment we get five, the end of that character's turn, we're going to cycle. And now there is a cycle effect. Our curse bear will deal two damage to the turned faces, and that will cause them to hit the breaking point on their humanity track. So we will reset this to zero and we'll move one up on the break track. The moment we do that, we will then hit the event number 7, so we'll discard this and read it. Before we read that event, I do need to remember we have a break effect that happens whenever we break the hate. So it says, when the turn faces break, each vagrant rummage may rummage one, so I'm definitely going to do that. I'll have our curse bearer do this one, He'll get, she'll get a candle, and then our songsmith will grab some salt. Now he'll have too many, so I'll look at him in a second, and he's going to you don't have to discard if you have excess. You can put the excess back into the cup, which is nice. Also, all vagrants will gain one humanity, and the haint will skip his next turn. The curse bear was the only one that was damaged, so we'll simply heal the humanity by one. And then our songsmith has too many tokens here, so we're going to take one rabbit foot and put it back into our cup. Now we can read event 7. Now, one quick thing. Pretend that I had dealt 5 humanity damage instead of 2. If ever you go above the humanity limit, you lose that excess. You can't use it for the next round. So the moment you get to the max, you're just going to set them back to 0. You increase the breaks by, or decrease them, I guess, by 1, and then resolve any events. The whole gosh darn train starts to shake like a wet dog. That can't be good. Each vagrant rolls one bone, and a bone in this game is a die, and resolves an effect based on the value rolled. Then remove event 7. So if we roll a 1 through a 2, we're going to gain spooked. Uh, 3 through 4, move 3 towards the round side. 5 through 6, move 3 towards the break side. If a vagrant move would end due to an edge of, of a terrain, that vagrant stops their movement and loses 3 humanity. Remember, when a haint breaks, skip the next haint turn and all vagrants gain one humanity. We already did that. The turn faces also have the extra effect that when you break that allows the vagrants to rummage if they choose, which we already did. First roll will be for the songsmith, and he gets a one. That means he'll be spooked. And then the curse bear will do the second one. It gets a two. Uh, she will also be spooked. Spooked has the effect if you end your turn in range, two of the turn faces lose to humanity. And remember, we can't get rid of Spooked if we're within range two of the haint itself. That's because of this special ability here. Our curse bear will then use two out of the three of her movement, one, two, to move here. And it is possible for you to move through the haint. You just can't end on the haint's space. Haints can end in your space. You get shoved over and of course you get haunted. We still have one movement left, but we're going to use our Old Knife Strange Blade. Reduce this skill's success value by two if you've moved this turn. So we've already moved. For each success, target gains uh, an additional humanity. So you can see here, I've put a coin, so it'll be one humanity for each success. Normally I need a five plus, but because I moved, it's a three plus. I'm going to roll two dice, have to be at range one. Uh, and it has to only target a haint. I can't target one of my teammates because, remember, if my teammates gain humanity, that's actually health. It's kind of the fun part. But she is only about damaging the haint. Two dice, looking for three pluses. We've got a three and a four. So that means 
each one of those are a success. So that means we'll deal two humanity damage to the hate. Now, if I had used two coins there, each of those would deal two damage. So you can see that could be really, really cool if you uh, put a ton of coins on that. We'll increase the humanity of our turned faces by two. We have one movement left. We're going to move here and let's investigate number four. We found an old suitcase, real old, like real, real old. <laughs> Couldn't hurt to have a little look. Let's see inside. So we're going to investigate if we get a zero uh, for successes. This is what we'll read. If we get a one plus, we get to read this. We only roll one die, but it's a three plus is a success. Come on, three plus. Oh, just barely a three. Bones filled to the brim with bones and all kinds of them. And only some of them are human. One seems a little cleaner than the others. For each success after the first, you may move one, pull out a rabbit's foot from the bindle, then give the bindle a good shake, then remove event four. Yeah, that didn't happen. I only got one success, uh, so I'm not going to be able to move it all. I'm just going to remove this, and now we know that there's bones there. Oh, boy. I do want to mention one thing about the dice. If ever you roll a natural six, that's called a box car. See how it looks like a box car? Uh, that explodes and you get to roll another die. And if I roll another six, well, then I get to roll again. So that's kind of fun. You do have those uh, exploding uh, critical hits, let's say. We did end our turn within range two of the haint and we are spooked. So that means we lose two humanity. We'll now activate the haint. We'll draw a token from here and we have our first candle. The candle is shaking hands. Target Vagrant loses two humanity. If this wounds a Vagrant, that Vagrant also gains the shakes. Determining the target priority can get a little bit confusing, so they do have a nice reference sheet here. The first thing you want to look for is if any of the Vagrants have special priority. No one does. Then if the action has a specific Vagrant that it's going for, the one that's the farthest away, the one that's closest, if it says that, then you know that's what it's going for. Next, you would look at the candle, the closest candle. If it, it has to be in the same train car. If there's a candle in another train car, it's not going to try and go for that one. The one that's going to work for us is the most hurt vagrant, a vagrant with the most humanity currently lost in the same train car. That is, uh, does not matter about wounds. It only matters about humanity loss, and that's definitely the curse bear. So this is going to target the curse bear. The hate will always move first and then resolve the hate action. The haint has a total of three movement. It would move one and then two to jump on this same spot because she now has been haunted and three here. But don't forget about the haunting effect. If ever our curse bear is haunted, she has the haint gain one uh, humanity as well. So now he's at three out of the eight for our second break. However, our curse bear did just lose two humanity from the attack because the attack deals two humanity plus the one from being haunted. So she's all the way down to four humanity. Oof. Okay, now it's the songsmith's turn. Unfortunately, our songsmith is a little bit too far away to be able to do anything useful this turn. So all he's going to do is move. He's also going to discard this salt to get rid of this spooked. And that's one of the two that we need to get rid of to be able to complete a second ritual. I'm going to place this marker here to remind myself we've removed one haint effect. We're also discarding our second salt. We're getting close to a cycle. We have a total of six movement. One, two, three, four, five, six. We're slowly getting closer. That's going to end our turn. Normally the haint would go, but I totally forgot that the haint should not have activated last turn because we'd just broken it. So we're going to skip the haint's turn this time and simply move to the next round. All we need to do is slide up our marker to number four, and then I think we're going to have our curse bear go again. Last turn, our curse bear used the old knife strange blade. Because we used that last turn, we cannot use it this turn. Instead, we're going to have our curse bear play all three of her coins here on the distant memory. So the coins on this one denotes how many dice or bones she's going to roll. That's going to be three. Four plus is a success. Range one or two, haint only. The target gains one humanity for each of your haint, or uh, yeah, your haint effects. When we currently have one, we're spooked. Then for each success, the target gains one additional humanity. So right now it's already at one. Let's roll three dice to see how much more we can get. Looking for four pluses here, we got one six. So we get to roll another one in. That's two successes. So we have two humanity gained here, plus the one from the effects. So that's three humanity. The turned face will gain one, two, three humanity, only two more, and we've done our second break. 
I would so love to use this salt to discard that spooked effect. I was all ready to do it, but I am within range two of the turn face. I can't do that. I can't get rid of spooked. So to end my turn, I'm simply going to lose to humanity. This could be bad. The turned face will go next. I'm going to draw a token. Oh, we have an eight. So how this works, we're going to resolve what this event is, but then that's not the, the turned face's turn. We'll then draw another token for him. And if we draw another event token, we'll resolve that event token and then keep drawing until he actually gets an action. A mirror? How did that get in there? Find junk card number 21, add it to your junk slot or to the belongings if your junk slot is filled. Oh, that's cool. Then discard event eight. We just got a mirror. We found a busted mirror. If you have a rummage token that matches a rummage token used after a hate within range two has taken its turn, that hate gains one humanity. That's cool. In my practice play, I never got that one, so I had no idea what that was. <laughs> okay, we have a rabbit's foot, and you know what? That's our second one, so we're going to have a cycle at the end of this. We know this one. On the yonder, target the furthest vagrant. Move to the furthest adjacent space of the target, haunting any vagrants in the most immediate path towards them. That actually isn't terrible. He's simply going to move all the way over to here. He is going to haunt our, smiths, our songsmith, so he'll take one humanity loss. We'll go from 10 to 9. Now we are going to do our cycle. When we cycle, we grab all of these tokens and put them back into our cup of joy. And now let's read that effect. We have vagrants in the same train car, which is both of them, move one towards the turn faces. Then vagrants that are adjacent to the turn faces gained spook. So the only one that's going to gain spook is our songsmith uh, because he's just sitting right there. So he'll gain that. And it'd be good if I found the correct token. <laughs> this essentially is only affecting our curse bearer because remember, we cannot end our movement on the haint. So that's as close as we can get to the turned faces. Okay, now it is our songsmith's turn. I've got a bit of a crazy idea. I'm going to use our old medley. And by the way, the old medley, you can actually take this action every turn. Normally, you can't do that on skills, but you can do that with this one. You can target anyone. So I could even target our curse bear if I wanted. Range zero through four rolls two dice. Normally it's five successes minus, you need a five plus minus the amount of coins you put on here. But because of our special ability, if we only put one coin here, it's actually minus two. So we need a three or higher to succeed. And this says uh, for each success, target gains one humanity. Over here with our a little rhythm, same thing. We can target anyone, range one through three. Target gains two humanity. For each of the coins here, you may move the target one away from you. Once again, normally a five minus one, so normally be a four, but because of our ability, the success, success here is three. Finally, I have placed our coin here for the two total movement. We're going to start with the old medley targeting the hate. We need two threes or higher. We've got a three and a five. That's two successes. With those two successes, one, two, we have just broken the hate a second time. We'll move the break marker here and we'll read event zero. The wooden beams that make up the train car walls begin to shift and slide outward, creating makeshift windows in the walls. But instead of seeing the wilderness or a train yard outside, all you see are bright blue faces looking in, open and wide. From now until the end of the scenario, the first vagrant to take a turn each round loses four humanity. Remove that event. Four humanity at the beginning of each round. Oh boy. We're then going to run using our movement of two, one, two, three. We're within range three of our curse bear, and we're going to roll two dice looking for a three or higher. If we do, our curse bear will gain two humanity. And then for each of these coins, so we have one here, you may move the target one away from you if you want. We'll roll our two dice and we have a one and a two. That means we failed on both of those. <laughs> Yeah, no, no healing for us. Oh, wait, I forgot one thing. We did break the haint, so we're going to be able to each heal one humanity and rummage one. I'm going to do that for sure. So we're going to rummage one here and we'll rummage one here. We have, oh, nails. Our curse bear will go to three total humanity and we will draw a token here. It's a candle. We'll just put the candle back in. We'll now move to round five and whoever goes first is going to lose four humanity. 
Are you ready to be a little bit crazy? I hope you are. We're going to have the curse bear go first. Guess what? She loses four humanity because of this. She only can lose one, two, three. When she loses her third, she becomes wounded. We're going to flip this one over, and now it says wounded, and we can no longer use that skill until it's healed. We'll then put our humanity back up, but now we've completed one of the rituals. After a vagrant suffers a wound, we get to complete this ritual. The turned faces will now gain 5 humanity, and we have 1 coin to use during the camp phase. This will push this up to the 5 space, and we're already both at full humanity, so we don't gain any humanity. Then, what we're going to do is simply discard this salt to get rid of this haunt effect. As a team now, we've removed 2 haint, not haunt, <laughs> 2 haint effects to complete this ritual. The turned faces will gain another 5 humanity, and we have another coin to use during the camp phase. This means we just took out the turned faces. No problem. <laughs> what a weird way to win. After completing this scenario, you have a victory or a defeat that you can read. Since we did win that scenario, we'll read moment 28. After a moment, standing in silence, they each relax their shoulders and let out a sigh of relief. One by one, the turned faces begin to slowly vanish out of sight. You can feel the burdens lift from their shoulders, but yours are only beginning. If all three rituals were completed, and there were no vagrants who became westbound during the scenario, which is true, I did get wounded, but no one became westbound, gain the cold shoulder milepost. After the camp phase, continue to the next scenario on page 5 of the scenario booklet. There's a neat little tracker at the back of the scenario book. You can go to their website and download a copy of it and then track your mile posts. After you've completed a certain amount of mile posts, you actually get to read certain moments you can see here. And then you do the same thing with banked coins. So if you choose not to use coins in the camp phase, you can bank them and mark this. And as you get higher up here, you'll have different moments. You also have doors, bells, and revives. I'm not entirely sure what those are, but I think you'll find out during the scenarios, which is cool. I always love that type of stuff. Next, you'd restore humanity to full and clean up your scenario, and then you can spend your coins. So we have three each, plus the three from the rituals. So that's a total of nine coins. What we can do first is spend four coins, two coins for each to gain skill number two and skill number one. This one will tell you it's, it's a left-sided skill, so this little dance might help move you out of harm's way. And this right one looks like the saying, the early bird gets the worm, turns out to be true. <laughs> I like how it tells you a little bit about the skills. I have no idea what they do. I don't see why I wouldn't do this. So I'm going to spend four out of nine of my coins to get both skill number one and two. Let's see what they are. The two-step shuffle, target gains two humanity. For each success, you may move one away from the target. That's only a three plus. Your coins will tell you how many dice you roll. This one can target anyone. For each success, the target gains one humanity. Then, if you're the first vagrant to take a turn this round, the target gains an additional uh, coins worth of humanity. Whoa! That could be really fun. Yeah, I don't know who I'm going to give those to yet, but those look great. You then can use coins for all of these different effects. You can heal a wound. That's probably something that we're going to do. You can rummage. I'm going to grab all those rummage tokens, put them back in the cup. I can draw one and then have someone start with them. You can actually draw different junk. I'll show you that in a second. I'm going to draw a random piece of junk from the tier one junk deck. Actually, I'll just do it right now. I'm going to shuffle these up. This one is available for us to buy, the Cracked Magnifying Glass. Reduce the success value needed for the Investigate action by two. Hmm, pretty good. So we can acquire that for three coins, or we can just draw a different one for one and then potentially do three more. We can perform a seance. Uh, that is one coin per vagrant, or we can bank coins. I'm going to use my fifth coin to heal my wound for our curse bear, so that gives me four coins left. For the seances, you don't know what the benefit will be for the next scenario, but it can help you for the next scenario. So I think I'm going to do this for two coins, one per vagrant. That means I have two coins left over, and I think I'm just going to bank those two. That'll move us up our banked coin track. So there you have it. That was scenario one of Vagrant Song. Boy, this game is unique, fun, cool. I mean, I feel like that scenario was pretty easy, but that makes sense. It's the first one. Let me know if you'd like to see the second one. I was kind of thinking about doing a couple more because <laughs> I really do like this game. Let me know what you think. 
Let me know if I missed anything so I can put it in the subtitles as well. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll see you at the next stop. Watch out for those haints.